where students can apply when I say apply but they apply for their project something that they a goal that they want to set it might be to write a piece of music for a loved family member and have that recorded because that's you know that's a permanent thing it might be to release an album it might be to release an EP it might be to start up a YouTube channel that's a great way to measure uh, progress as well start up a YouTube channel and, and, and actually many Many people do that. They share their piano journeys as adult beginners or intermediates on, on YouTube, and, and people love that stuff. Hey, teachers, welcome back to the Topcast, your home for inspiration ideas, business, and teaching strategies that's going to help support your teaching and grow your studio. If this is your first time here, then welcome. Uh, if this is your 245th time here, then welcome back. It's great to be hanging out with you again today with another interview with a fantastic teacher and actually another returned guest. My guest was last on about episode 60 something and then also at about 100 or 150 as well. He's been on a couple of times and it's the great Tom Donald, um, incredible jazz pianist from the London Contemporary School of Piano, also one of our expert teachers in Top Music Pro. Have you ever wondered whether recitals and forcing kids to perform on stage is really the best way to assess their growth in their music learning? Particularly as many of us move towards more creative pursuits and getting students using apps and composing film scores and doing backing tracks and improvising and all sorts of using all sorts of tech and digital audio workstations and things like that. Is it still the best thing for us to get them up on stage and performing, particularly when many of them are really not enjoying it very much, the whole process of it? I mean, some kids love it, don't they? But other kids really do not. And I was actually, when I was younger, I was one of those kids who did not like it very much. I'm actually recording this introduction just after we had our member webinar recently. So every month we hold a members only webinar for our Top Music Pro members and we were talking all about recitals and performance anxiety and all those kinds of things. And it was a great discussion because it really makes me question whether there could be other alternatives for finally assessing where students have progressed to during the year because that's effectively what a recital does. So today with Tom, we're going to be unpacking some alternatives that you might want to consider for some of your students who maybe are doing things more in the composing and recording and songwriting kind of realms because Tom has a huge amount of experience with doing things a little bit differently. He's also an expert marketer and a teacher of adults and all sorts of things. So we'll unpack all of that today. Today's guest is a passionate advocate for the use of chords and improvisation in all music learning. He's also a champion for the struggling adult amateur by connecting them with their inner genius. He's a real coach. He's worked on musical transformations with countless students over the last two decades and now heads up the London Contemporary School of Piano. Welcome to the show, Tom Donald. Great to see you, Tim. How are you? I'm very well, actually. And uh, it's been a little while, actually, since we caught up. You've You've had a baby and some significant life changes. So you kind of went off the radar a little bit, but I'm really glad that you got back in touch with us and you're back on the on the scene and I'm looking forward to helping teachers uh, again and really looking forward to finding out how things have been going for you too. So welcome and thank you. How's things in London at the moment anyway with the vaccinations and all that? It sounds like that's going pretty well. Yes, uh, there seems to be a lot of progress um, and uh our, our studio has reopened again, which is which is lovely. Of course, a lot of people are still very uncertain right now if, whether they want to continue online or go offline. So there's lots of decisions people have to make uh, in their learning, but um, all all on track and fingers crossed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, last time you were with us was back in episode 68, actually. I went and looked back at it, 2016, and we were talking about the importance of harmony. We're talking about chords and all that kind of stuff. That was, I cannot believe that was five years ago now. Um, and then you came back for episode 150 when I did my special with five other teachers, so that was super cool yeah. too. And then you host, co-hosted a webinar for us on about teaching and marketing to adult students. So any of our Top Music Pro members on any of our plans can access that uh, webinar, which was super helpful and gave us some great ideas. And so actually, before we go too deep, for those of you or those people who haven't met you, tell us a little bit about you and your uh, music school over in London. Yeah, well, that was five years ago, I think, when we last spoke, and there's been so many changes even to our school since then and so many very positive developments. Um, 
I'm the founder of the London Contemporary School of Piano. We started around 2009, 2010. So we've been running for over 10 years now. And uh, we are a very, we're a creativity based uh, piano school, um, music academy piano school. And we, we have students from over 35 different countries, uh, both delivering online, offline classes. And uh, and I'm as myself, I'm a pianist, uh, um, I guess a bit of a hybrid pianist. I, I don't sort of stick to any particular genre. I'm a bit of a mashup, <laughs> as so the critics say. And uh, um, so, which I which I, I still enjoy um, making mischief on my musical side as well. So yeah, that's uh, that's probably the that's probably the, the summary. I think you're underselling yourself. Tom is one of the best jazz pianists out there. Like amazing stuff. Hey? Don't undersell yourself too much. <laughs> So today, one of the first things I wanted to talk about was performances and recitals, because I've had a long held belief that getting kids up on stage in their tails and bow ties and bowing and a grand piano and clapping politely isn't always the best way to assess our students' progress. It's just a hangover, really, from when the only thing we taught in lessons was how to read and interpret and perform music. So with more creative approaches happening in lessons and the impact of technology, the teaching mix is changing, but the assessment or the final result hasn't necessarily changed. So are, are you are you feeling the same? And is that one of the reasons that you've started branching out into other things? Most definitely. I remember vividly now, I think it was around about 2017, 2018. I don't know when I came up with this idea, but I think it was like three in the morning. <laughs> and I thought to myself, there, you know, I had an album that was just coming out and it had done reasonably well and you know, I had some nice reviews and I thought to myself, actually, this is okay form of assessing things. Um, I haven't even stepped into a gig for this one um, or a performance. And I thought to myself, you know, with the ease of releasing one's own music these days, I mean, and the platform's available for anyone. Um, we can talk about that today. I thought this would be a great thing for our members to do, our students to do. I think, I mean, we teach a lot of adults and adults particularly get very terrified of, you know, um, performing in front of other people. Mm, 100%. And, uh, and we do have, we have what we call our open mic events, um, which have been running online and we treat them like jam sessions to take away the sort of the strict formality of it. And, you know, it's a, and when we ran them in, in person, which we're starting them up again, it was really just a nice piano in a nice bar and the adult students could sort of have a drink or two and then, you know, <laughs> head over to the piano and perform their piece. Um, and then we would have a, a student who might be feeling more brave would perform, you know, maybe a set that they, you know, they, they wanted to step forward and do. But it was such a supportive environment. It wasn't like this sort of binary thing. I'm going to play a recital and you know, my notes will be right or wrong, which is, you know just disheartening for so many people um absolutely and uh, particularly if their performance doesn't you know go according to plan and and there's nothing wrong with performance I, I mean i love performing myself um and not all my performances go according to plan it's a great way to grow but it it's not as you're saying tim it's not the only thing and uh so that my sort of 3 a.m idea in 2017 was to to have a course called we call it the artist in residence course the air course at the london contemporary school of piano where we where students can apply, when I say apply, but they apply for their project, something that they, a goal that they want to set. It might be to write a piece of music for a loved family member and have that recorded because that's, you know, that's a permanent thing. It might be to release an album. It might be to release an EP. It might be to start up a YouTube channel. That's a great way to measure the progress as well, start up a YouTube channel. And, and, and actually many... Many people do that. They share their piano journeys as adult beginners or intermediates on, on YouTube and, and people love that stuff. So, and since we've started it, it's really taken off far more than I ever thought it would. Of like some of the success stories we've had over the last few years, th these are exceptional stories of just uh, everyday people who been given, I guess, a place to express their creativity and mm. have that nurtured. So uh, let's take us through how uh, another teacher might be able to use this using your thing as a bit of a case study. So can you tell us how, how you go about this? I assume this is the culmination of a series of lessons with you about composition. So they've created some works. Is, is that right? Or a song? 
Yeah, I would say it's probably the most. It's, it's you know, pe- piano teachers often say, "Oh, yeah, lessons are tailor made to your your um what your Interest. desires, yeah, interests, what you'd like to learn." This is probably pushing that to the absolute, like really putting that on the table and said, "Okay, I really want to cater to what it is you musically desire to do." So we've been doing this mainly with adults. So we've had some children do it, and it's gone extremely well. So. And of course, I saw a way you can apply it to your studio is just simply ask, ask your all of your students, is there a project you'd like to do? We're now expanding into to not just doing exams or, or performances, but we're, we're facilitating projects and you can give some examples. Um, is there a musical dream you've all, always had? I'll have to find the email mm. I wrote at 3 a.m. in the morning when I <laughs> came the idea. And I spoke a little bit about how how I wanted to blur the lines between being a music school and a production house. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We were a production house. I wanted some people to come on this journey with me and experiment what that could look like. And after I sent that email, I had one of our students, one of our members, he said, actually, I've always wanted to do an album. I have a song that's been in my head for 30 years. Ah, amazing. And he'd only yeah. taken an intensive course with us. So we sat him down um, for a you know, a couple of weeks with our teachers and taught him the A to Zs of the chord system. Like, like here's all your major minor chords. And he wasn't learning those chords to become a pianist. He plays piano pretty well now as a result, but he was learning the chords so he could pluck them out of his head because this song had been playing in his head for 20, 30 years. Mm. And the song was released last week. And it's been amazing. Yeah. It has an orchestral part. Um, I, pl- I was the session pianist on it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? He wrote the parts out. Like we taught him how to find the chords that were playing in his head because I, I can't read his mind, right? Yeah, so and, yeah. and he and he wrote them out uh, on a chart and says it goes like this. And I'd play it. No, 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 actually, no, that bit goes like that. And he was in the driving seat. And so that's just one example. And that was a very a very emotional moment for that student, just a, a wonderful moment for him to have that song come to, to fruition. So that's an example. Yeah. And how do you go about doing the recording for, for teachers that may not be, you know, have a recording studio? I mean, in fact, do you have a recording studio or are you doing this on simple technology, garage bands and things like that? Yeah, so this is, a, I mean, I guess I felt I had a, a good step ahead in this in the sense that I, I do have a production past and, and I understand how to use production technology. But I would say if you don't use production technology, it's probably a good thing because you can outsource that. You probably just want to find a good local recording studio and, and engineer or producer that you could collaborate with. We're now getting enough projects now that I actually don't have time to <laughs> deliver them all now. I, I can't just do them all as the director of the school. So we now have a, a in-house engineer who has a recording studio and our students go there. And because we're in London and there's lots of wonderful choices of recording studios, uh, we tend to fit the studio to the project. Having said that, um, even if you're in a smaller place where there's only a couple or one or two recording studios, yeah, I think it's it's probably the smart idea is to outsource that because you don't have the pressure of having to to be the you know the complete deliver the, the complete producer of the program, but. Mm. Um, it definitely, you know, there's nothing more wonderful than sort of seeing your student in a recording studio for half a day after preparing them for that. It's, yeah, it's and it's an amazing yeah. experience for them as well. I mean, I, I remember the, some of the first times I've, I've been on both sides of the recording. I've been a recording engineer and also in the recording studio, and it's an incredible experience because you, you never quite understand what goes into recording an album uh, until you've been in there and worked with an engineer. So. I like that that's the approach that you can use. I think, of course, if you were just doing this for a first time as a teacher, you could do it really simply in your studio. You're not going to have that same um, effect, but it could be a really good way just to test this as something that your students might like to do. And then you can go, well, you know what? This is so good and you're enjoying it so much. Why don't we connect you with this local recording studio? Let's go and make it sound incredible. That's right. And you can test it at your own studio. You know, your own teaching studio only might need a few microphones to do it, and and you don't have to have the most audiophile sound. It could just be a way of testing the waters a bit with some of your students and get them to record. Say, okay, we're going to record your your repertoire in you know two months from now, and you know you, you can 
you can play the song as many times as you like and and really get inside the song. That's the wonderful thing about recording. And all the concert pianists do it. Even in the in the very strict classical world, they all record their song and do like oodles of takes. Yep. And edit out mistakes sometimes. <laughs> oh, they do all yeah. the time. I've seen it. I have stories I know. And, <laughs> and technology is amazing these days. You can edit out mistakes and yeah, there was in, in one recording of one of our students, there was a note we decided on the piano that we didn't need anymore. And we actually, for that project, decided to get it mastered at Abbey Road Studios. And the engineer could just find my bad note and, and remove it. Take it, it. out. Uh, amazing. Stereo track. I mean, it's incredible. So, <laughs> and, and yes, a, a lot of the, the, the pros at the top of the, the field in this are, are doing that. But the, the point is with recording, I think, is it, it is a fantastic way where a student or even a musician, um, when I say a musician, even for teachers who are, who are pianists, to realise their musical vision and their artistic vision. We've even had a lot of piano teachers come and work with us for this project because they've sort of realised, wait, you know, if I have a, a lovely album of my favourite repertoire that I've curated myself and designed myself rather than, you know, just playing all of the tick the box repertoire to prove that I have stripes as a piano teacher, actually investigate the music that I'm passionate and interested in. That's a, that's such a big difference. And actually I think audiences enjoy that more. It's more authentic. It's more mm. real. Yeah. And how do you take that next step? So let's say you've, you've gone and got a student, they've recorded themselves and maybe multi-tracked, maybe they've added a bass and the drums and they've got a song, it's packaged up. Uh, you can, of course, release that uh, publicly in your studio and share it with the other families and things like that. But you actually go to the step of releasing. So can you tell us what that means and, and how that works? Yeah, so we're now acting as a, as a record label almost. <laughs> as, as Though our students have full control over the, what they want to do with their song. And it is, it's not particularly complicated to release um, your own music on um, Spotify, Apple Music, all of the platforms that people are consuming music today. Uh, you need a distribution company to, to partner with. Um, some of the more popular ones are ones like CD Baby and uh, yeah, I forget some of the names of the other popular ones. We use a smaller one based in the UK because we find their customer service is much better and they can actually go a step further and pitch the tracks to playlisting on Spotify and Apple Music. So we, so we have a student who's releasing a piece in six weeks, which we're fairly confident we might get uh, playlisted, which is amazing. That's going to get then. She's going to, she's a dentist and she's going to have fans, <laughs> you know, um, which is, yeah, which I think is just awesome. Just hybridizing, you know, being a musician and, and, and your day job. Um, and uh, so where we go through a, we go through a distribution company called Emu Music in the UK, where I think they've got, far better um, customer service than some of the ones based in the States who just have too much of a backlog. Mm. But it's, it's very easy to start an account with them, submit the files, submit the artwork, and they'll, yeah, you pay them a, a small fee and they, they release the music. And that's then available on Spotify, Apple Music and those things. I assume you kind of check boxes where you want it to, to be released to. So that company does that aspect of it. You don't need to worry about that. Yes. And then once it's out there, it's your job to, you can then share it with whoever you want and then hopefully it gets picked up and played and people enjoy it. Well, yeah, we share it with our members. And for our members and our students, it's such a morale boost. Oh, you know, one of our students has just released this song. Check it out. And, um, and people love that. They, they share it with their friends. And, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely feeling for the student too um, who's you know, gone through this journey and it, they've had moments where, just like a performance, they're still a little bit like, you know, scared or feeling like doubts about themselves and you have to coach them through that potentially. But once it's released, uh, um, it's just a fantastic feeling of morale booster for everyone, um, for our whole community mm. it has been. And I imagine, have you done this with uh, children as well? And, and if so, what's the reaction from parents? I mean, they must love this. Yes, yeah, so we have some children who, um, with children we've, We've had different styles of releasing um, the music. So some parents didn't want the music to be so public necessarily. So we've just looked at goals like creating recordings and you know composition portfolios. We have one student who's done so exceptionally well on this uh, on this course. He's composed something like twelve pieces. He was only meant to compose three or four, but he's just got on a roll. And um, we're 
we're now talking to some of the uh, some of the exam boards in the UK who may be interested in publishing one of his pieces. Oh, that's amazing! As sheet music. Yes, yeah, and uh, he's just gotten really good because kids too are very you know they they pick up technology quite quickly, and he's become very good at using Sibelius and putting making his own scores and. Um, his scores are now getting to a very high standard and we've, we've been able to sort of then help him sort of uh, release some of these pieces by talking to exam boards, which if it gets into, I'm, I'm, I can't, I'm, I'm only speculating this point, but it's looking fairly positive. So I'll have some updates soon when I can say something <laughs> about that. That's very cool. <laughs> uh, he or she would be tickled pink to see themselves <laughs> in an exam book. It'd be amazing. <laughs> Now, you've, you've mentioned a couple of times my members. Now, not many piano teachers call their students members. So I'm interested to unpack this a little bit. Why do you do that? Probably because we have a lot of adult students um, and some of our adult students are based in other countries. They may have a local piano teacher. I think being a, a member or a student at the London Contemporary School of Piano involves so many things. We have a, we have a membership portal area with videos and training. It's not just live lessons that we do, though we do do that. Um, and, of course, now we have a production side. So I think, yeah, there's there's a membership aspect to, to what it is we do as well. And do, do you charge, uh, like, do a subscription? So can people kind of book for a monthly package or something like that? Because I know you do some really clever things with your marketing of adult lessons, particularly overseas as well. Are you still doing that today? Yes, since uh, I think since the COVID uh, pandemic, tourism in the UK has really dropped. So we've done this more remotely, um, focusing more on online. We do have a subscription package, uh, even for people who don't necessarily want to take one-to-one lessons. They just want to join our weekly seminars and our weekly training. Of course, then we also have packages for people who want intensive courses or who, who want one-to-one coaching with you know, goals for their piano playing, whether it be short term or long term. So we do have a variety of options. I think since we've last spoken, it's probably a, f- a few more now. Mm. As And particularly, I think since in the last 12, 18 months, I think uh, there's been a sharp change in what people want. And there's been a lot of testing on our part. Um, so, yeah, that's one reason probably why you haven't seen me is because I've had my head down and I've been testing so many new things and not all when you test things not all of them work (laughs) of course can can you give it can you let us in on any uh any secret wins that uh that you could share without giving away your whole business (laughs) I'm I'm very happy to be transparent about it um uh sharing is caring you know but I, I think you know and I don't think it's even a secret I think there is huge leverage to be made of group courses right now online. You can't get 15 pianos in a room without creating chaos, <laughs> um, but you can o- over a Zoom call. And uh, we've had such amazing feedback from some of the courses that we've designed uh, with, with groups of students. We have up to 50, 60 people on some of our courses. Um, I could do a, I could, yeah, and I've, we've learned ways of, to make it work well. We've made mistakes as well along the way as we've learned this very quickly, but I'd be very happy to share. I'd be happy to do a whole podcast on that. Yeah, I, I, think, we, I think we've got another webinar or a podcast that we could do on that one. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but I mean, just to, for any teacher out there is thinking, oh, I'd love to do a group course, but where do I start? The best place to start is just you've been teaching one-to-one lessons for many years, presumably. So get the things that have worked the best as a one-to-one teacher that you've been saying over and over and over again to your students and just turn that into a group course because the things that get the most feedback one-to-one are the things that also get the best feedback in a group. So perhaps you already have a course just ready to go, um, even if it's just a short course with three or four modules. Mm. And I imagine that a lot of what you're doing, just going back to the uh, student releases as well, can work in your marketing too. H- how do you leverage that? Yeah, and I, it's and to be honest, I didn't even think about the marketing opportunities from you know successful projects. It was more or less just a an opportunity for students to express themselves a bit more on their own terms. But we have one student um, who. He's a teenager. He released uh, um, a few tracks that went viral on YouTube. And um, he lives in Mumbai, India. He used to come to London quite a lot to learn with us. And he's also learnt with us online for about three or four years now. And he came to London. We went to a very, very good recording studio and we we recorded about three or four pieces. And uh, they, they, I think 
they've now got over 3 million hits on YouTube, some of them. And, and I mean, that's obviously been a great help for the, that's great for marketing for our school, obviously, because uh, it has been released under our, our label, but I didn't expect any of this to happen. And, and that's, I think that's what I've loved about this so much. So many amazing wins have happened mm. that we didn't expect. Right. Yeah. And it was easy to see at the start of the pandemic to just kind of tear your hair out and get just completely dismayed by the whole world and what was happening to music teaching. But it's been an incredible, innovative time for so many lessons, teachers, studios, new things are coming out of it. And and, and this is just one of those ideas. And I, I love also encouraging students to, with their parents' permission, to be on YouTube and to share things there because that's where kids are these days. That's where they're seeing and learning so much. Congratulations. The 3 million hits on, on, the, on the few videos on YouTube is amazing. Obviously, being very, very popular. I don't know. I said to him, I said to this student, you can look him up. His name is Shavank Manon. I might post a link of some of his work. Yeah, well, share a link in our show notes. Well, I said to him, I don't, I don't know what your secret is, but I'd be quite happy to become your student. So you can... <laughs> <laughs> I've got a lot of stuff on YouTube, but none of it's got 3 million hits. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I don't imagine many of them are doing the releases or the YouTube for money, are they? I mean, it's more just the fun of it, exposure, enjoying what they're doing. Yeah, it's definitely, um, and that, that's one thing about streaming, it doesn't pay, it pays pennies. So this is not, this is not done by the student to obviously, uh, you know, to make money out of um, building a music career. If, if any student really wants to build a music re- career as a recording artist, I mean, that's years and years of, of not making money first yeah. <laughs> with, with the chance that, that that might be profitable later on. But for these students, it's, it's purely an, a form of artistic release and the opportunity to have a platform and play music on their own terms. Yes. Yeah, that's what I love that. about it. Mm. And, uh, and it's interesting when you're not trying to, I think that's why this course has gone so well, this program's gone so well, is every, because we're not focusing on it like a record label would be who's trying to survive with it. We're, we're not even thinking of that. We're just thinking of the artistic legacy that the student's leaving behind and the, the best possible project that they can, they can you know, deliver with their creativity because we're not thinking about monetizing it in any way other than the fees for the course um i think that's one reason why these tracks have actually done really really well even commercially because we're not focusing on that well a lot of other artists might be thinking oh i've got to release a track or i want to become famous or whatever yeah (laughs) of course when you don't think of those things at all and you just focus on on the creativity and the innovation and the authenticity um you have something that's much better and how are you going with your own performance? Uh, you, you're obviously much more constrained now that you've got a child as well. But, uh, you know, a year ago you were performing at the top of the Shard quite regularly. I mean, imagine all that stopped. How, how are you getting your own artistic um, intent out there? Yeah, so I think actually since we last spoke, 2016, I've been performing much, much more, obviously, before the pandemic. And uh, I had a, I had a a residency at the top of the shard. We've actually recently been back in there to um, I've sort of recorded some improvisations on a, a series of classical and popular music pieces. Um, and we've just made a recording for Sky Arts and about 40 other channels, I think. Um, so whilst there hasn't, there hasn't been a real audience up there other than a production team, we did this uh, two weeks ago now. Um, I think in about June or July, it should be it should be on TV and different channels around the world, which is quite exciting. Oh, man, that's amazing. Oh, I didn't realise it was being filmed as well as audio recorded. Yeah, so I have. Uh, I'm, I might share a couple of uh, videos on your portal that I'm not releasing publicly until September when I'm playing back up there again. But I've been doing some mashups like, you know, uh, based on the audience dares I had at the gigs. So at the gigs, I'd often say to the audience, I'd say, okay, tell me your favorite pop song and someone would shout out Bohemian Rhapsody or whatever it is. Um, this is unscripted too. So mm. I, I, I can promise I haven't practiced. It's just all off the, the cuff. Yeah. And then another person in the audience says, uh, my favorite classical composer is Debussy or something. And then I have to play Bohemian Rhapsody in the style of Debussy. Oh, well. That'd be amazing. <laughs> um, some of these experiments go okay. Some of them, um, yeah, you know, it's I wouldn't release after <laughs> 
<laughs> but the Bohemian Rhapsody one went surprisingly well. Um, I survived anyway, so I'll, I'll share it. Um, that was quite a fun one. Oh, please do. Yeah, let's share it in our um, member forums uh, over at Top Music Pro. That would be amazing. Um, yeah. Do you – when you do that kind of thing, you must – like you have to know the song, how to play the song itself first, like let alone be able to play it in the style of Debussy. I mean, I'd be trying to muck around, trying to learn, like remember how to play the Bohemian Rhapsody firstly. Yeah, I, I mean, I think improvisation is is a bit of a to me. It's a bit of an extreme sport. I think that's why I like it. Um, yeah, but, I mean, that is truly living on the edge. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm a bit scared of heights as well, so it adds to my edginess. But um, <laughs> but particularly if it's at the top of the shard. But yeah, I think often I ask the audience to give me a few choices. There might be three or four composers, three or four songs, and then I. I've got like five seconds to make a quick snap judgment. Go, okay, Lady Gaga in the style of Bach. Okay, Bad Romance. Uh, uh, yeah, that could make a fugal subject, I guess. And then I just, you know, try and. Amazing. <laughs> that, one, that, one, that one is on YouTube. Um, that was at a, that wasn't at a shard. That was at another venue. But that one. I survived that one as well. I don't survive all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone can have a laugh at the end of it and enjoy it. Um, yeah. that, that is so so great to hear. Um, I mean, that, that skill alone is just extraordinary, uh, being able to do that kind of thing. So, yeah, congratulations that you've been continuing to, to get things out there. We look forward to being able to see you on, on TV or hear your recordings um, because you are a phenomenal player. It's uh, magic to I, listen to. I will add one thing to that is, and I'm not saying that I, you know, this is the easiest thing to teach. Um, obviously, just doing sort of off the cuff, mash this up with with that. But um, we are developing a course at the moment, and it, and it's it's going to be in very early stages. We're hoping that it will start in June, where I'm going to look at, I'm looking at creating a completely different teaching system where we don't actually learn a piece of music at all in the, the, the four weeks of the course. We just, and this is sort of probably a bit behind what I'm doing when I'm doing these sort of improvisations. I'm not thinking, oh, I'm going to learn how to play this song or that song because th that approach just doesn't work. So it's a, it's a course where I'm building a bunch of formulas. So I, we, in the first module, we will teach something like 10, 15, 20 grooves. And I'm, we're, it's like a form of what I'm calling a groove technology where if you just, so for instance, yeah, a reggae piece of music has a certain groove mm -hmm. and it, it can be very easily quantified. You know, you've got the second and the fourth beat of the bar with a, with a strong beat. The bass line is usually doing a certain something. In a pop song, you know, in an Elton John song, he's usually doing a thing like this, you know, you know in tons of his songs and mm -hmm. lots of others. Power ballads tend to have the same groove. So the modules consist of chords and learning how to just change between chords and plug them into different grooves. So you could get, you could get, a, you know, you could get a, an Alberti bass. That's a groove. Mm -hmm. So you can pick a pop song and play it in the style of Mozart. If you start, and that's what we do in the final modules. We just plug different things into each other and see what happens. That's really cool. And so the course will be based on not actually learning to play a, a particular piece of music, but just, it's learning how to plug different things into each other and see what happens. Yeah, the styles, patterns, and grooves of different genres of music. Uh, mm -hmm. I can I can imagine our our members and our teachers would love that. So uh, yeah, definitely keep us in the loop with how that goes. I'm actually picturing like a patch bay in a uh, recording studio where they used to actually exactly. yeah plug different things in manually. Uh, <laughs> all done in computers now. That's the whole idea is, is you just, and I, you know, if you think of a pianist, at, like a cocktail bar pianist at the Ritz or somewhere at, a, you know, at some hotel and, you know, someone walks up and says, do you know this song? And they don't really know it, but they still can somehow play it. Yeah. So what is that cocktail pianist doing? They're going, well, that's a piece that does that. And that, I guess I remember when I, the only time I heard it and it uses that groove, that, that's exactly what those types of musicians are doing. Mm. We're sort of playing off the cuff. And I, I want to build a system for that because I believe there is a system for it. It can be systemized and, and people can study this approach. And, you know, it's a bit of an ambitious course, but I think, I think you know, if we, if we put out the first release of it in, in June and then we see how people get along with it and we start getting feedback, I think we'll figure out really effective ways to teach this formula-based approach. Yeah, I love it. Uh, looking forward to hearing more about it, Tom. So I'll make sure we share it with people when uh, when it's up and live. 
Mate, you've already been up for three hours and it's only like 7.30 or something for you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start wrapping things up. Um, but uh, thanks thanks so much for sharing those ideas that you've had. Uh, great to hear your vision and your view about this alternate to recitals and, as well. And I really want to challenge teachers out there to use the technology that's available today and also reconsider, do we have to get kids up on stage, whether that's online or in person, reciting, playing a piece of music that they've learned to sort of say, yes, they've had a successful period of time. Do we need to do that? Is that going to be suitable for everyone? For some of them, absolutely. Some kids love it. But for others who don't, and maybe they're not actually spending that much time doing that, maybe they're spending more time on GarageBand or in FL Studio or whatever software they're using, maybe there's a different approach we can use. So I love that you're on the same wavelength with that. And you've had so much success. So thank you for sharing. Uh, where can people find out more about your school and all the cool stuff you do? Yeah, so best is just to go to our website, contemporaryschoolofpiano.com. And uh, if you have any questions based on um, some of the things I've spoken about, just sign up on the contact form on, on the homepage and just let me know that you've been uh, listening to this, uh, this top cast because I'll be able to... Uh, prioritize your questions and make sure that they're answered because uh, I you know, I really you know, our mission is is not to just do things our way but our mission is to change the way the world teaches music so we we want we want to see teachers do try these things and you know we all learn from it together so just drop me a line and I very happily uh, answer your questions and for all our top music pro members you guys can contact Tom in our forums as one of our expert teachers and we'll make sure he gets tagged Yes, yes, absolutely. Fantastic. It's great to get back there again. Yeah, I know. I know. We haven't seen you for a little bit, but uh, I totally understand why. So congratulations on all your successes, Tom. Great to catch up with you again. And um, yeah, hopefully when these borders open, we might be able to hang out and have a beer again over in London. <laughs> oh, I would love that. So I really miss uh, um, being able to travel. So, I know. Yeah, yep. Lost for, for that ASAP. Fantastic. All right, mate. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, next week on the podcast, we've got the wonderful Nikki Loney. Now, if that name is ringing some bells in the back of your head somewhere, you may know Nikki from The Full Voice, which is The Full Voice podcast, one of the biggest podcasts for voice students and teachers, and also the publications by the same name. And uh, as a fellow podcaster, it's always great to chat to other teachers who are helping other teachers as well. So, Nikki and I are getting together next week to talk all about why we should be getting students to sing even if you're an instrumental teacher. So, we'll find out how to do it, some ideas, some really simple ideas and strategies that anyone can implement in their lessons with no books or equipment or anything like that and ways to get started and why you might like to think about doing more singing in your instrumental music lessons. So, that's next week. Until then, I'm Tim Topham and you've been listening to The Topcast from topmusic.co. We'll speak to you soon. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio, from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.